The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Our next presentation is going to be Spall Repair by Low Velocity Spraying. It's going to be given by Fred Goodwin. And uh, Fred Goodwin is a chemist with over 30 years experience in the construction uh, chemicals industry, including <coughs> cement manufacture, research, development, and technical support of grouts, adhesive, coatings, shotcrete, stucco, flooring, and concrete repair materials. He has been with BASF as it, and its predecessors for 28 years and is an active member of ICRI, ACI, ASTM, NACE, SDE, <coughs> and SSPC. Oh, it's enough? Okay. Fred, he needs no introduction. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm going to stand here at the podium, then I don't drop the microphone and all that kind of stuff. I'd like to thank especially a former colleague of mine, Patrick Doc Watson, who originally wrote this document. And I uh, appreciate in absentia him sharing a lot of the information with me and sharing his experience. Okay, uh, spall repair uh, by low pressure spraying. A little different than shotcrete, uh, wet mix shotcrete. Uh, it comes kind of from the plastering industry. You know, the definition, and I'm, I am going to have to. Uh, similar to wet mix shotcrete, it sprays a much lower velocity. It comes in the form of prepackaged mortar. So it's a combination not only of an application technique, but a material. Uh, it's used a small concrete pump, unlike shotcrete, where you have to have a uh, heavy duty pump. This can use a rotor stator uh, type of pump. And it's using a low slump mortar. But the low slump mortar has a low enough viscosity, it spatters out, kind of like a ceiling texture gun. Air's added at the nozzle to impel the mortar, so the pump pumps the mortar, and then it's hit with a jet of air at the end to spatter it into place. The cohesion of the mortar allows it to stick, wrap around, meld into the repair. Uh, it's low velocity, so it's fairly low tech. You can cover large amounts of areas rapidly with it. When do I use it? Works great for surface repairs, vertical, overhead, cosmetic, um, used in a lot of applications, bridges, piers, stadiums, tunnels, retaining walls. Uh, typically applied in a half an inch to four inches in a single lift, depending upon the skill of the applicator and the consistency of the material. Uh, you can apply it in lifts and go up to maybe six inches, depending on the speed of the hardening of the mortar. Typically, these materials are not rapid hardening. It's a way of modifying the rheology of the material so that it is cohesive and has non-sag characteristics. You may, uh, if you're going really thick, uh, you may consider form and pour some other application methods, because the materials do tend to be somewhat expensive compared to conventional concrete. How do I prepare the surface? Typically, you want a pretty rough profile, uh, CSP greater than 7. This comes from ICRI 310.2, the concrete surface profiles. It's a way of measuring degree of roughness. Uh, you can see 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, method of preparation. Hydro demolition is a beautiful method because now I wind up with the soft concrete going away. The cracks are routed and flushed out. I now have a saturated surface dry concrete, and uh, so and it's fast. Sandblasting or abrasive blasting also works quite well if you can achieve that kind of a profile. Uh, pneumatic hammers, but avoid bruising if that happens. Bruising is creation of micro cracks. Imagine taking a hammer, smacking the surface of concrete. You brush the dust away. You still have little cracks that aren't joined together. That's a plane of weakness. Things will fall apart. So if you do use pneumatic hammers, a sharp pointed tool, a lightweight hammer is preferable, but it's also beneficial to follow it up with shot blasting, sand blasting, or uh, high pressure water jetting. Uh, check for contamination. Uh, chemicals, oils, greases, 
Uh, the water spot test I show here, simple, easy, cheap, and quite effective. If it beads water, watch out. Something's keeping things from penetrating into the concrete. If the concrete has different colors, that's another indication. Uh, soaps, uh, check for carbonation. Uh, this uh, phenolphthalein indicator, excuse me for using a brand name, but you can buy it from Granger, which is a common industrial supply. Pink means it's healthy. Pink means the concrete is not carbonated. It's a very intense color. You do need some moisture in the concrete. Uh, you can also get it from lab supply houses. Uh, used to be able to make it out of X-Lax tablets, but they changed the formula. Believe it or not, <laughs> I love that kind of trivia. Um, you should have a saturated substrate. It should be wet, damp. Uh, you'll get better adhesion. Uh, the mortar manufacturer and engineer typically have their own requirements. What do I do about cracks? <clears throat> well, you can repair the cracks. You can fill the joints. You can route and seal. You can inject. But if you try to bridge over a crack with this material, remember, it's a cementitious material. So if that crack moves, it's likely to telegraph or cause debonding. So pay attention to the cracks. How do I select the right material? I finally found a generic mortar bag, thank goodness. You know, it should be proprietary, prepackaged, cementitious materials. You might be able to cobble something together in the field, but uh, getting, uh, typically these use some very cohesive powders to create that rheology, such as silica fume, and good luck getting that dispersed in the field with a field mix. It just does not happen. Uh, specifiers, applicators, uh, pay attention to uh, guidelines 320.2R is probably your best uh, or one of the best ways of selecting uh, materials. Uh, ACI also has some excellent documents, uh, specifically 546.3R uh, material selection guide goes into a great deal of detail. Um, also 546.1 repair uh, guide. Also, read the data sheet. Don't wait until you have a problem before you go read the data sheet. Read it beforehand. They put a lot of good information in there. Uh, physical properties, uh, bond strength, free saw durability will vary from project to project. They'll vary from material to material. Uh, when they're used, um, they may require the material to be coated with protective barrier system, you know, belt and suspenders. Uh, protection is really one of the less expensive things you can do for concrete. Creates a barrier between the hostile outside environment, keeping the concrete where it should be. But always pay attention to the curing and drying time before you apply the material. What equipment do I need? Grout pumps for low pressure spay. I've got some examples in a few minutes. Uh, an air compressor. Doesn't have to be a high volume like you have with shotcrete. It's basically like putting on ceiling texture. So spattering it. A uh, suitable mixer. Anybody that's been on a job site, you've had the mixer break. And when that happens, everything gets crazy in a hurry. So having some spare parts, having a spare mixer, a backup plan, do unto your future before your future does unto you. Water measuring device, keep the consistency the same. You're pumping this material, you're expecting it to apply uniformly, so keep the consistency. You may have some variation in bag weights, uh, different mixing times, different mixing shears will affect the material, so be consistent in what you're doing. It gets boring after a while, but the more times you do the same thing the same way, the more consistent the results will be. Um, the guy at the end of the hose and the guy at the mixer need to be able to talk to each other. If they can't, again, things will get crazy in a hurry. Uh, finishing, handling, and testing tools, you know, have everything laid out. Preparation is 90% of success. Common pumps. Uh, good old rotor stator or Moino pumps, another brand name, excuse me. Um, these work. Uh, you mix the material and it goes through this progressive cavity pump is technically the name. You've got a stator, which is a spiral rubber sleeve inside a pipe, and the rotor is a, another spiral metal piece that turns and it squeezes the material out. It's a uniform flow. It can generate quite high pressures. 
Uh, then I've also seen these peristaltic or squeeze or carousel pumps work. Um, these have a flexible hose and then a cammed arm that rotate around and it squeezes the material. There's a little bit more surge, uh, but both of these work very, very well. They're not extremely expensive equipment compared to shock creating machines. Common nozzles. This is not wet mix shotcrete. These are wet mix shotcrete nozzles. Way to tell. The, the accelerator, you don't use an accelerator with this, and the air go way back. With these, the air is going right at the tip. So it's just creating this spatter pattern. Uh, some different types of nozzles that are commercially used look like those. Lots of other kinds of equipments out there. Then I found this crazy stuff. I've never used this personally, but it's kind of a cool idea. Uh, this is a few hundred dollars. Even Amazon sells them. You have this hopper that you can dip into the mixed material, scoop it up, and then the air goes in um, this part, and it squirts out and jets. So very low tech, very simple, easy equipment. I don't have personal experience. There's a YouTube video if you want to watch it. Safety considerations, read the safety data sheet. They're now called SDS because of a global harmonized system. Uh, it lists information about how the material can hurt you if you don't pay attention to your proper protective equipment, uh, disposal, shipment, and transport. Gloves, goggles are wonderful things to have. Uh, keep the material away from your body. It is cementitious. You can get alkali burns. Eye wash is essential to have on the job site. Respirators. Shouldn't have a whole lot of dust with this material, unlike dry mix shotcrete, but you're still going to be mixing material at the mixer, so don't breathe the dust. Uh, ventilation of closed spaces. Uh, secured storage. Uh, fuel for the equipment. Uh, safety meeting. Again, do unto your future before your future does unto you. This guideline from ICRI, uh, Guidelines and Recommendations for Safety, if you have to do safety meetings, it's a wonderful resource to have, but it goes through a lot of the types of equipment, a lot of the procedures, and it is application specific. Uh, Pre-construction meeting. Plan things out, get everybody on the same page, figure out who's doing what, when, and where, and how, so you don't have people walking all over each other. Uh, participants should be the owner, engineer, contractor, materials manufacturer. Address everything you can think of and then ask people for questions. What hasn't been covered? Find out who's going to do what. And I've seen a, a five minute meeting where the project manager says, what are you doing? When are you going to do it? Something goes wrong. Who are you going to talk to? You. What are you going to do? Where are you going to be working at? Who are you going to talk to when something goes wrong? And that thought process is very, very helpful. Um, Pre-job meeting, availability of power, water. How do I get at the site? What am I going to do with my debris? What about dust and emissions? Make sure that everything's on hand and all the documentation's there. How am I going to cure it? What do I do when things break down? What are the finish requirements? What kind of testing is needed? And try to think of it, anything that can go wrong. Murphy's Law works overtime. There's actually O'Toole's corollary to Murphy's Law. It says Murphy was an optimist. So inspect and approve the surface preparation. Saturate the substrate. 24 hours is a good idea. Should be saturated surface dry. Install the specified reinforcement. Make sure it's clean, snugly attached. If you're going to use bonding agents, corrosion inhibitor, anodes, or whatever, uh, have them installed. Then start mixing the repair mortar, load it into the pump hopper, spray it. Uh, apply the mortar to the thickness recommended. Uh, you may overfill and then go back and screed and finish. And then finish the repair. Confirm that everything looks good. And one nozzle operator may require multiple people to finish. That's usually the bottleneck is the finishing. What kind of texture do you want? Verify the thickness. Verify the drying conditions. 
uh, setting characteristics, whether repair is vertical or overhead. So just some pictures of doing this. There's another nice video I'm not going to go into, but uh, this is how it goes up. It's a rough finish. You have to go back and finish it, but it's fast, easy, simple, low tech. Depends a bit on the material, but easy to do one or two inches. Uh, if you go thicker, am I going overhead or am I going vertical? Yeah. It depends on how good you are, how you've mixed the material, and the nature of the material itself. So just a little video. Make sure you cure it and coat it. You know, follow the guidelines, ACI 308. Use a C309 or C1315 curing compound or wet cure it. And follow what the manufacturer tells you. They've got a vested interest in trying to get everything to work right. How do I check it? Can't take enough photos. Document everything before, during, and after. If you can, make sure the surface prep is okay. That's a really nice thing to photograph. Check for carbonation. If you're going to use a testing agency, make sure that they know what they're doing. Bond pull-off testing is also very useful to make sure you've achieved adequate bond. And confirm that all the materials were used as specified. Check the purchase orders. And you should have success. However, if you don't, if you don't succeed at first, redefine success and then celebrate your victory. <laughs> so anyhow, I thank you very much. And... Uh, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you may have. You all don't have to speak at once. We have time for one or two questions? Yes, sir. Is that uh, the phenolphthaleins, is that a contaminant that you have to remove after you do your test? Is what a contaminant? Excuse me. The test for uh, carbonation. Oh, phenolphthalein, you really wouldn't have to m remove it. It's just if I have embedded seal, carbonation will allow general corrosion to occur. There's a couple of kinds of carbonation. There's early age carbonation, which occurs when high CO2 levels are experienced when the material's fresh. That's usually like an efflorescence on the surface causing dusting and latents. Longer term carbonation is where CO2 slowly penetrates into the concrete, doesn't really harm, to harm the concrete, but it will cause corrosion of the steel. So if you encapsulate the steel and it's going to rust, it's going to blow things apart. So that's the reason we say check for carbonation, but phenolphthalein, to my knowledge, doesn't cause any bonding issues. It's typically in an alcohol solution, it dries very quickly. Well, thank you, Fred. Thank you.